Welcome to Simply by Grace, a podcast of Grace Life Ministries with founder and director, Dr. Charlie Bing. This podcast and other helpful resources can be found at our website, gracelife.org. Now, here's Dr. Bing. Well, if you would open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, we're going to continue in our study of the book of Philippians, and we're going to go through verses 19 through 30. And we're going to talk about six marks of a person God uses. Six marks of a person God uses. You've been out, you've been around, you've been shopping, you've been eating out, and on almost every other store, it seems there is a help wanted sign. Where are the workers? I think. If churches were to be more public in their display, and uh, you would see on every church or chapel the same thing, help wanted, servants needed. There's much work to be done and not that many to do it. Even Jesus said uh, that the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So pray for laborers. Uh, He was talking about spreading the gospel and, and reaping the harvest of people for eternal life, that's one job that the church has a shortage of helpers in, but there are so many other things that groups of believers, churches, assemblies need done. Help wanted. Servants needed. Many people gauge their involvement in a group uh, or a church based on whether it is convenient or comfortable for them. So their degree of comfort is their excuse instead of the degree of need that is present. It'll cramp their lifestyle, or it will inconvenience them and make them miss a football game, Monday night football, or Thursday night football, or Saturday night football, or Sunday night football. There's always an excuse, right, guys, for football. So we we use as an excuse many times our degree of comfort in doing something instead of the degree of need that is there and that we see right there in front of us. Can we really serve the way that God wants us to serve and the way that Christ served us? the way that Paul served the church in Philippi. You know, it really has a lot to do with what I think is the theme of this book in chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The challenge of a servant is to have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, we have a mind of servanthood that is willing and wanting to serve others instead of serve our own desires and our own needs. So I think the book is organized around that theme of having the mind of Christ. In other words, thinking with the same priorities, values uh, uh, that, that Jesus Christ himself thought with. And today we're going to look at two, what would be otherwise ordinary guys, one named Timothy, one named Epaphroditus, and um, we're going to look at their examples of servanthood. Now, you remember that Paul, when he wrote the book of Philippians, is in prison. And from prison, you're not able to do a lot for yourself. So prison in those days often depended on the help of outsiders to provide you food, clothing, and things like that. I've seen that in other countries, actually, whereas in America, they lock you up, they feed you, they clothe you, they give you a TV and a weightlifting room and everything else. In some of the countries I've been in, you, they, they'll lock you up, but if your friends or relatives don't bring you food, you're out of luck. They don't bring you some of the basic necessities. I think that's the way the Roman prison was, and so Paul was still able to co- uh, communicate with his friends and partners in ministry, and they were able to help him in some way. And we'll find that both Timothy and Epaphroditus are with him in Rome and helping him And he sends one of them back to the church at Philippi 
with this letter before us. He had planned to send Timothy, he says uh, in verse you see it in verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. So his plan at first was to send Timothy, but instead he sends Epaphroditus. Evidently he needed Timothy there and Rome with him for whatever point. And he mentions Timothy first because probably Timothy was best known to them uh, and also had more credibility as a partner in ministry with Paul. He had been with Paul since his second missionary journey. He took the place of John Mark, who had proved untrustworthy. And so Paul uh, started to travel with Timothy, and uh, he calls him his son in the faith. So he evidently led him to the Lord, um, or at least discipled him in the Lord. He spent a lot of time and poured a lot of time into Timothy's life. In Paul's epistles, he mentions Timothy 24 times. So there's quite a bit of attention given to him. And we could assume that he was somewhat Paul's successor, as in some of these uh, instances where Paul planted churches. He, in 2 Timothy 4, he, he's ending his letter by uh, kind of passing on to Timothy the ministry and saying, I've finished my fight and I'm poured out like a drink offering. And um, he assumes that Timothy is going to take up from there. And he mentions there, as he did, does in chapter 2, verse 17, that he had given his life and his, it is poured out like a drink offering. Chapter 2 and verse 17, I got this one right. Yes, and, and I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I'm glad and rejoice with you all. What this shows us is that Paul's attitude was one of service to the degree that he would pour out his life or expend his life for them. Now, when you pour something out as a drink offering, it's, it's gone. You don't get it back. Uh, a drink offering was maybe poured on the ground um, and absorbed by the ground, and it's not something that you can get back. So Paul is saying that he spent his life in service to them, but now he's in prison, and he commends Timothy to them. So let's look at what Paul says about Timothy and Epaphroditus both that we might see what are the marks of a person that God can use. Well, in verses 20 through 21, uh, he says this about Timothy, For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Here he's, he's saying, I think, that a person has to have the mind of Christ to be used by God. So the first mark of somebody that God uses is that he has the mind of Christ. I get that from him saying that no one is like-minded. Now, this could be understood in two different ways, which is really, in the end, really the same way, but he could be saying, I can't find anybody that's like-minded like me, Paul, or I can't find anybody that's like-minded like Timothy that has such a mindset as Timothy. But both that is implied that both Timothy and Paul have the mind of Christ. So at the bo bottom of it, the foundation of him saying that is that this person, Timothy, has the mind of Christ. He's either like Paul or he's like Christ, or, or he can't find anybody that thinks like Timothy. So in, in his attitude towards the Philippians specifically, Paul's attitude was expressed in verse 17 that he would pour his life out in a life of service. And so he was looking for somebody who would have that same kind of commitment and mindset. And Timothy is that kind of person. So Timothy had the humility to put others first. And basically, that's what chapter 2 taught us earlier, that the mind of Christ involved. Well, it was an attitude of humility that would lower ourselves to put the needs of others first. who would look after Christ's concern before his own, in verse 21. Um, because he says, all seek their own. In other words, there's many, many people, but they're doing their own thing. They're not interested in doing God's thing. They're not interested in people as they should be. I'm not going to take the time to go there, but if you look at Paul's letter to the Romans at the last chapter, chapter 16, 
he names 26 people that were he greets in Rome. Why couldn't one of them, where he is now in prison in Rome, have been used and sent back to the Philippians? Well, it, he says, even though he commends some of them, evidently they weren't as like-minded as Timothy in that they were willing to sacrifice and serve the needs of the Philippians. Timothy obviously was willing to put people first before himself. Ministry is not just about accomplishing a certain purpose that we might feel or have. Ministry really is about people. You can't have ministry without people to serve. Jesus came. He came with a purpose, of course, but that purpose was people. And so people is, is at the heart and always will be at the heart of what we do in ministry. We have to meet their needs and not think of what we're doing for ourselves or even for our organization. I've been in situations in um, ministry where I, I think I showed somebody a picture one time of uh, working with inner city uh, children in, uh, in a ghetto type of situation. And, and the comment by one person was, how can you touch them? I've been with missionaries in other countries who make fun of the people in that country and say, oh, they're all act, they all act like children. Uh, you know, they're all stupid. I mean, all kinds of derogatory things. I don't know why he was there. But it wasn't a mindset of ministry that brought him there or a mindset of service that brought him there. You know, there's many, many needs in any assembly of believers. And there's many, many needs overseas when you look around. There's just not enough people to meet the needs that are there. How many do you know who would go with a selfless attitude in the mind of Christ to humble themselves and serve the needs of the people that they encounter? Who would you send? Who would be at the top of your list? Where would you be on that list? Would you be a first choice of someone who would be willing to serve the needs of others or the needs of anyone or needs of a group? Someone has said that we all live in chapter 1, verse 21, or chapter 2, verse 21. Now look at chapter 1, verse 21. He says there, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. That's what he says in one twenty-one. But in chapter 2, verse 21, he says, Each seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. You see, you either live in 121, for me to live as Christ, or you live in 221, where you seek your own, not the things of Christ. We all live there, maybe some in between. But obviously, Paul's model and goal and what he was looking for was someone who lived in 121, who was willing to serve Christ and to make him the center and focus of their life and priorities. So the first mark of someone that God uses is one who has the mind of Christ. In verse 22, we come, I think, to a second mark. We read verse 22. He says, But you but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. What's the key words there? Proven character. Timothy had proven character. So, The second mark of somebody that God uses is that this person would have proven character. Now, the word proven means tested and approved. Uh, He compares it as a as a son, um, as a son with his father. Now, obviously, a good son. A good son would be somebody who would pass the test of obedience, a submission, and is dependable. And certainly, Timothy passed that test. He was there for Paul on the second missionary journey. He traveled with him on the third missionary journey. He suffered with him on these journeys. He's with him in Rome, even at the present moment, while Paul is in prison, different culture, different place, far from home. But he's proving his character and his care for, for Paul. And Paul calls him a servant of Jesus Christ. Um. 
he served with me in the gospel. And elsewhere, he calls him a servant of Jesus Christ because he served with him in the gospel. He also calls him a brother here. A brother, of course, is a, a, a term of uh, intimate endearment to someone. Um, other places, Hebrews 13, verse 23, lets us know that Timothy had even been imprisoned. So he had proven himself to the point of great sacrifice and danger and imprisonment. He had passed the test. What we want to do then when we look for those who we call upon to serve God are look for people with proven character who we see already serving faithfully. Not that we promote to a position and assume that they'll do it, but we find the ones who are already serving in some capacity. And that's a clue that they're going to serve well. When it comes to looking for those who serve and minister in the church or really in any, organi- any volunteer organization like a church group, um, I always say f- function before form, not form before function. And let me explain what I mean. Function before form means that you look for somebody that's doing the job and then you give them a title or a form. Okay, you'll, you, I see that you're serving people. I think you'd make a good deacon. Our church is voting on deacons today. And, one of the, and the person that they're voting on today is a person that just naturally serves all the time anyway. He's already a deacon means servant. He's already a servant. They're just giving him the title. So the function comes before the title, the form. It's not form before function. We don't say, we need deacons. We're going to make you a deacon. Now, start serving. That's not how it works. We want to see people who are proven themselves as servants and in ministry. And then, and then if they need a title or a position, then we give it to them. So we don't want to jump ahead of ourselves and give people positions or responsibilities in the, in the church until we see that they're faithful, dependable. You know, that's a good reason I've always argued for those who would become pastors to start out as uh, assistant pastors, which I had the fortune of being for a number of years before I actually became a senior pastor. I was a, worked as an assistant under someone. Uh, not only is it good in that he takes all the heat for everything in the church, and you get to sit back and and watch him, but you just learn a lot from watching him without having all the responsibility the ability that he has. That's really called what we, we call discipleship also. It's, it's bringing someone up, helping them grow, uh, or working them into uh, maturity and a position perhaps in the church, mentoring we might call it. All of those things are good and helpful when it comes to using people in service. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 10, when Paul is telling Timothy how to select deacons in the church, he says, let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. It's not serve as deacons and then we'll test them. It's let them be tested and then let them serve as deacons. So everyone has the past. To t- if you want to, to really have a responsible position, uh, in, the, in a church group, then you must pass the test of faithfulness. You know, it's unfortunate that we see today so many so-called, what I would call celebrity Christians, fall into immorality or dictatorial leadership styles that cause them to lose their ministry. Um, we could have a long list even of what has happened in the last 12 months probably of well-known musicians, well-known pastors, well-known evangelists. Uh, and some of these people gain celebrity status because of a t- they can speak well or they can sing well, but they've never proven themselves faithful in ministry. So they start fast, but then they fade, and eventually they fall. We don't want to elevate people beyond their faithfulness, beyond what they've been tested to do. We want to elevate people who have proven themselves faithful. 
I think you can find yourself, whether you're a, a good server or not, by finding an area of service and just working at it. And people will be watching. How are you doing with it? Are you, are you faithful? Do you show up? Do you get the job done? Do you finish it? Do you do it with a good attitude? Can you prove yourself before you seek any title or position? Just work on deepening your service, and God will broaden that ministry. Well, he goes on in verse 23 and 24. He talks about, uh, therefore, I hope to send him at once. That's Timothy. As soon as I see how it, it goes with me, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. That's just discussing his plans there. He waiting to see how things unfold before he releases Timothy. Obviously, Timothy was needed at the time. So from Timothy, we learn these two marks of somebody that God uses. First, somebody that has the mind of Christ. Secondly, somebody that has proven character. And now he turns to Epaphroditus. And from there, we're going to learn, I think, four marks of a person that God uses. Now, interesting that uh, Epaphroditus means charming or amiable. So it must... Maybe he was a likable guy, or uh, he grew into his name, but he certainly seemed to be a likable guy. And in verse 25, he says, Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow servant, I'm sorry, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and the one who ministered to my need. So instead of sending Timothy, he sent Epaphroditus, and he's explaining why he sent Epaphroditus was because of what he says here. And look, he lists four things which kind of uh, uh, reach a crescendo. In other words, they build from more general to specific. First, he, he calls him a brother, and then a fellow worker, and then a fellow soldier, and then a messenger. Uh, and as the one who administered to his need. Let's look at those four things. I think what, he's, what the mark of a, somebody that God uses here is he's pointing to somebody who can balance strength with service. Because you see that in the four characteristics he mentions, both strength and service. First of all, Epaphroditus could relate. He's called brother. So Paul had a close relationship with him that he was able to call him brother in a spiritual sense. You know, spiritual relationships can be thicker than blood relationships. Maybe you've found that out amongst your own family. You get along with some believers much, much better and more intimately than you do with people in your own family. It wasn't a superficial brotherhood that Paul had with Epaphroditus, but they were truly bonded over similar experiences and, uh, and similar ministry. In fact, he was also called a fellow worker. That's the second thing that describes him. He could work. That kind of indicates that he was both diligent and disciplined. Paul could count on him to get a job done. The third thing he mentions is that he calls him a fellow soldier. And what do soldiers do? Well, they stand firm. They defend when they have to. Uh, they know who the enemy is. They, they know what side they're on. And they're loyal to the ones with who they're fighting with on their, their side. So loyalty, taking a stand, being strong, standing against the enemy, standing against adversaries, all of those picture the qualities of a good soldier. That probably meant a lot to Paul when he called him a, a fellow soldier. I don't know if you've seen that series called A Band of Brothers, um, which is about you know, bat battle in World War II, but you saw the unity of these men who worked and fought together and how loyal they were to each other. That's why it's called A Band of Brothers. There's a TV series that I really like, and it's on network, I mean, it's on regular TV, so it's, you know, it's clean, basically clean, um, and it's called SEAL Team. I don't know if you've seen that one, but I really enjoy SEAL Team. And they're always talking about 
their brothers, their brothers on the team, you know, and their loyalty to their brothers on the team is so strong that it sometimes exceeds their loyalty to their wives uh, who are always upset that they're putting the team first and going out on missions and so forth. And that's kind of what the struggle in, is in a lot of the shows. But, but they, they call them their brothers. And uh, you even find today those who are veterans uh, uh, joining together in, in, in immediately recognizing and appreciating the brotherhood that they had with their fellow veterans, no matter how many years have passed. So a soldier is somebody who stands firm. He knows the enemy. He knows what team he's on. He's faithful to his teammates. And that would describe Epaphroditus. And then finally, he calls him a servant. Uh, not really a servant. He says, you're a messenger. Actually, the word messenger is the word apostle. We get the word apostle from that. Now, Epaphroditus wasn't an apostle as one of the apostles, but the word in general meant somebody who was sent as a messenger, um, somebody sent with a message. And so it's translated in many Bibles, as in the New King James, a messenger and somebody who ministered. Um, he was a messenger in the sense that he brought this letter to Paul and the gift of the Philippians to Paul while he was in prison, according to chapter 4 and verse 18, where it says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma and acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So Epaphroditus was a messenger sent, or an apostle in the sense that he was sent to Paul with this letter and the, the financial gift that, that helped him. Kind of reminds me of um, when we look at this character of Epaphroditus who had both strength um, to fight and uh, a mind to serve, a heart to serve. Reminds me of the Old Testament character of Nehemiah. You remember how Nehemiah fought with the enemy, he commanded everybody to fight with a sword uh, or have one sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand and work on the wall but keep your sword nearby. And so Nehemiah was constantly willing to fight the enemy that opposed him building the wall, but he was also willing to serve or, and organize the work. And Epaphroditus was both willing to fight as a soldier and also willing to serve as a worker. So this characteristic, I think, of uh, someone that God uses uh, shows that one, it, it has to be somebody who can balance strength with service. And then in verses 26 through 27, I think we see another mark. It says in verse 26, since he was longing for you, Epaphroditus was longing for you all Philippians, and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Well, you see, Epaphroditus was evidently very sick when he was in Rome with Paul, but he evidently recovered by God's mercy. And Paul says, that's a good thing, because God had mercy on him, because it was mercy to me too, because I, I really needed him. It would have been a double grief to be in prison and lose Epaphroditus. So what we see here is the mark of Epaphroditus that shows him to be a servant is that he was burdened for others. Paul says that he was longing for them. And not selfishly, he was longing for them because he was worried that they were worried that he was sick. Imagine that. I've seen so many testimonies about people who have been in the hospital for long stays and their relatives can't visit them with this COVID. And you know, one of their chief concerns is, my family doesn't know how I'm doing. I wish I could tell them how I'm doing. And they're worried about me and I'm worried that they're worried about me. So Epaphroditus was worried that the Philippians were worried about him. He was burdened for them and he longed for them. Kind of indicates that he was homesick. He was 800 miles from home, which is like something like a six week journey to Rome to be with Paul, far from home, and the people that he loved so much. But God helped him get well. And because of that, Paul is 
rejoicing because he doesn't have to sorrow about Epaphroditus dying, even though he came close to it. You know, I'm, so the, this fourth mark of someone that God uses is somebody who's burdened for others. But let me pause here and make a couple observations about divine healing, okay? Because it says God had mercy on him. There's a lot of false teaching and uh, flamboyancy going around, you know, over the issue of faith healers and so forth. But Paul never says that he touched him and healed him. In fact, Paul looks like he's pretty helpless in the situation. He saw Epaphroditus suffering until God had mercy on him. So it tells you that Paul wasn't there as a healer, which might indicate that the gift of healing was an apostolic gift that was foundational to the church, but maybe started to fade away as time went on. That's why he told Timothy in his epistles to take a little wine for your stomach's sake. He didn't say, go find a faith healer, or you don't have enough faith to be well. And that's another point, by the way, about faith healers, is many times they imply that those who are sick are sick because you don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith that God wants you healthy. And so the person feels guilty that I'm not believing hard enough. No, Epaphroditus was a faithful man. I'm sure he had great faith in God, and I'm sure Paul was a faithful man praying to God for him. But he almost died. And then God had mercy. So it was God that healed him. Not a person, not an individual, not a celebrity. It was God who healed him. And he healed him in his own time. And so in in spite of the fact that many people say that sickness is a sign of your weakness or weak faith, it's actually here, Paul commends him almost as if it's a badge of honor. That this man was sick, showing his faithfulness to me. He almost died. We need to change our perspective on illness. It's not a curse from God. It's not because we have weak faith. We can't always explain why we are sick or someone else is sick. And we can't expect them to be, always be healed by a miracle. It's up to a sovereign God to heal as he wishes, when he wishes, if he wishes. And sometimes the best healing is to go to be with the Lord, who can complain that that's not the best healing there is. Uh, Labor Day, I met with a wonderful man. He's, he was an elderly man, but he made a trip from California over here because he wanted to meet me and a couple other people. But he had been using, reading one of my books um, on Lordship Salvation, and it changed his life completely. He said, eight years ago, it just turned my life around. In fact, this person happened to be related to somebody who is like the right-hand man of one of the biggest Lordship Salvation teachers in the country. And he wrote a book about, from a free grace perspective, about Christians who sin. And he wanted me to endorse the book. And he was telling me he really depended a lot on my book when he wrote that book. And so we met for lunch on Labor Day. And then he was going to come to our conference in October. And he wanted to sell some of the books. But a week before the conference, he called me and said, Charlie, I just, my doctor just told me I have... Uh, three blockages in my heart, and I have to have bypass surgery. The problem is my heart's only functioning at 25% capacity, so I don't think I'm going to make it to the surgery. So I've called all my family and friends, and I've told them I'm probably not going to make it through. So I won't be at the conference, he says. He wasn't at the conference. I prayed for him uh, for his surgery um, the day, a couple days before the conference, but I didn't know... His wife, how to contact his wife. Yeah, I, sent, I sent him an email and him a text. Took a long time to find out, but finally we found out that he did live about 10 days after the surgery and then died. Wasn't a sign of his weakness. He was faithful to the end. He was enthusiastic about the Lord. He had written a book, uh, which I hope others will, will get to read. And... Uh, even though his family, when he changed his views to appreciate God's grace, his family ostracized him. His siblings would not talk to him anymore. 
So illness is not a badge of dishonor. Good people, faithful people, servants of God, sometimes God calls home. So the mark of somebody that God uses is somebody who is burdened for others. Are you burdened for those in your life that are around you who have issues, who have problems, who don't know the Lord at all? Somebody who needs help, somebody who is sick, somebody who is needy? Are you burdened for the world and the needs that are out there that you know about? There's so many that we don't know about. Sometimes I think if we knew about all the needs that there are in the world and all the situations that are going on, it, it would overburden us and we, we'd break under that pressure. I mean, I just read yesterday that 60, 60 Nigerian Christians were kidnapped. There's 17 missionaries in Haiti that are being held hostage. You've heard about that. They're demanding a million dollars each for them. I mean, we go on and on and on. There's so many great needs. Are you burdened when you hear that kind of thing? At least enough to say a prayer for these people. Well, in verses 26 through 29, he gives another mark, a fifth mark of somebody that God uses. So let's look at verses 20, 28 through 29. He says, Therefore I sent him, Epaphroditus, the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with gladness, and hold such men in high esteem. Paul is saying, Epaphroditus deserves your respect. Hold him in high esteem. esteem. Those that God would use as servants are those who can be respected and honored and held in honor. Honor him in the Lord, he says. Esteem him, which means to hold up or value somebody. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 through 13, Paul writes, Recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. So there's a command there to esteem those who are working for the Lord in a responsible position. God deserves the glory for what is accomplished, but servants deserve esteem. Not because they're seeking it or promoting themselves, but because they're promoting God and honoring Him. Paul talks here about um, Epaphroditus and how he made up for the lack of ministry that others were not showing him. So he did not neglect that. He was to be respected. If we asked our friends, our family, the ones who know us best, our fellow members and we worship with, if we asked them, would we find that their opinion of us is that we are respectful and that we deserve to be respected? Do we keep our word? Do we have integrity? Do we serve willingly? Do we have a good attitude? God uses those who are respectable. And then finally, in verse 30, he says, Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Epaphroditus did what the others could not do. I don't think he's saying that y'all neglected me and weren't paying attention to me. And Epaphroditus is filling in. I think what he's saying is that uh, you couldn't, what you couldn't do, Epaphroditus did. Not what they wouldn't do, but what they couldn't do. So what you couldn't do, Epaphroditus was able to do. He fulfilled that service to me, even to almost dying for him. He was committed. So the sixth mark of somebody that God uses is one who is committed. Committed to the point of almost dying. He put himself last. He was willing to die in the service for the Lord, in service to the Apostle Paul. He wasn't paying attention to his own need. He was living in chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live as Christ, not chapter 2, verse 21, each seeks his own things. Epaphroditus truly illustrates 
that he was living in Christ first. In fact, we could say he was dying to serve. Would you say that of yourself? Are you dying to serve? Maybe you're not called upon to be put in such a position where your life is at risk, but maybe it involves ministering in a certain part of the city, a certain part of the country, or a certain part of the world where things aren't friendly and there is danger present. Are you willing to serve or even die for others. Can I review these with you, the six marks of a person who God uses? The first one we said was somebody who had the mind of Christ. The second we said is one who has proven character. The third we said is one who can balance strength with service. Number four is one who is burdened for others. Number five, one who is respectable. And number six, one who is committed. These things were the same that were true of Christ, if you think about it. And they're also true of Paul when you look at his life. They kind of summarize in some ways what it means to have the mind of Christ. And that's why God used Jesus. And that's why God used Paul. And that's why God used Timothy. And why he's using Epaphroditus. Because I believe in a word that we could say that they have the mind of Christ. A mind that's willing to humble itself and serve the needs of others. So, my friends, we need more servants. You'll never see a church with a help wanted sign out on the building. But I guarantee every church could put one there. There's much to be done. You say, I can't do anything. Can you vacuum? Can you sweep? Can you change the batteries in the clock, which somebody didn't do? (laughs) I noticed when I came in, daylight savings time, somebody didn't change the batteries. We all, I haven't done them in my home, so don't feel bad about that. You don't have to be a talented speaker or teacher. Or youth worker, there's a lot of things that need to be done around the church that may not involve person-to-person activity, just taking care of the facility in the way that a servant would. We have too many celebrity pastors and musicians and Christians today. We need more servants. I encourage you to find an area of service, as I know many of you already are, I don't know everybody and their involvement, but this group could use your service. And to those who are listening, I'm sure there's an area of service you could find. Don't wait for somebody to ask you. Volunteer or go up to your leaders and say, what can I do? God wants me to serve somewhere. What can I do? Let's pray. Father, we realize that we're here today because Jesus Christ served his Father by laying down his life for us, paying our sin debt and rising from the dead and offering us the gift of eternal life. And his service doesn't end there because he comes to live inside of us and live through us. And he serves us every day with every breath that we have. We thank you so much that we have Jesus Christ as a model. And we are challenged today to have the mind of Christ and to serve others as he has served us. And so, Lord, we all ask ourselves, what more can we do to serve in your work, to serve people that you love? And I pray that you put on the minds of each of us the ways that we can serve and in a heart that's willing to do exactly that in the mind of Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. For more resources, or to help spread the message of God's life-changing grace, visit our website at gracelife.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message at simplybygrace at gracelife.org. See you next time.